taking a different turn today on the podcast. I was interviewed by Anthony Renna about the dark side of owning a gym. And what I did in this podcast is I shared all the stuff that went wrong for me as a gym owner, the sticking points, the burnouts, the lawsuits, the betrayals, the criticisms, the money problems, all those things I kind of unpack and uh, create the silver lining for you on the other side. But hopefully you enjoy my dramatic conversation with the great Anthony Renna. All right, guys, welcome to another special episode of the Strength Coach Podcast. We, we do this once a month with Vince Gabriel, founder of Gabriel Fitness Performance and uh, Fitness Business University, as well as Kiss Marketing. Uh, he's also the author, if hopefully you heard last episode, The Ultimate Guide to Small Group Personal Training. We're giving those away. Uh, there was a link on uh, on the Strength Coach Podcast notes as well. as You can just go to smallgrouppersonaltraining.com. Vince, thanks for doing this, bud. What's up, Ant? Thanks for having me back. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, Vince, we talk a lot about the good stuff. You know, really about, you know, the financials. And usually, like, when we got, like, the, for example, when we had your guests on, the, the guy, some of, some of your top performers, those are your top performers. And, you know, you always clarify, like, hey, look, even when we did the other episode about how much, you know, the average increase was for the year you did say hey look that's not everybody yeah but you know and, but we do we do all you know obviously that's that's the point we want to keep it positive we want people but but there is a a dark side of of owning a gym as well and uh i like that you're you you wanted to to address this topic so i uh, i think the way i want to start this is you know ignorance is bliss and when I decided, I, I remember the day I told my dad, my dad was a pretty successful financial uh, guy, like bond, he had a municipal bond firm in the eighties and then, you know, had a career in uh, wealth management after that. So he was a successful person. And, you know, when I was growing up, I was just like, oh, I just, just do what my dad does. It's like, that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I got to college and I'm taking like, macroeconomics and microeconomics and i was just like i don't even get this at all and i was just i hated it i was terrible at it and i was just like man this is like not for me and i was playing football at the time and my dad was never really an athlete he was he was you know grew up in queens so like he didn't play like he never played high school sports like it just wasn't like a thing for him and I was like really into sports and really into fitness and working out and, and all of that. And I was just like, I just, this is what I love. I love this stuff. And at that point in college, I was just like, dude, this, I think this is, I was getting to the point where I was like going to need graduating and needed to decide on a career of what <laughs> I wanted to do. And I was just like, I definitely don't want to do that stuff. And I told my dad, I was like, I'm going to be a personal trainer. And he kind of like could see the look on his face. My dad was a really good guy, but um, he could see the look on his face. And he kind of like did this, patted me on the head thing and said, okay, son, you know, you go do that. And, you know, let me know if you ever want to, <laughs> this is what, this is not what he said, but this is what I thought he was saying in his own head. Let me know when you want to get a real job and I'll help you find, so, you know what I'm saying? Like kind of call like me when you're ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so he, it was good of, of him not to like, talk me. I'm like, what are you doing? You're, you're going to make $30,000 a year. Like what, like, it's like, how are you going to support a family like that? Like, that's probably what he was thinking. And so anyway, he doesn't do that. And I go off and I go off to San Diego and I got a job as a personal trainer in San Diego. Right? And I loved it. And I was just like, at the point where I was just like, I had never, done anything in my life that I loved as much as training people like training kids training adults I was just that I had that like young trainer just man I would do it for free I just loved it everything about it and I got like five years into it and then I you know I started at 23 so at 23 you're not thinking about like your rest of your life you're just thinking about the here and now and I got to like 27 and I was about to get married to Vanessa and I'm just like, ah, uh, you know, 
I, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to do this forever. But yeah, mm-hmm. I was making 30, $37,000 a year. It was the most money I ever made as a personal trainer. And so I was just like, well, what's the next step? The next step is owning a gym. And I was like, all right, that's what I'll do. I'll just own a gym. And I'll move to New Jersey and own a gym. And I just thought that because that's like was the next step. Like I can probably make a little bit more money than I'm making as a trainer. And again, going back to my comment, ignorance is bliss. Like I did not know the massive amount of things that I was going to have to go through to be able to find success as a gym owner, right? And so I just got into it with this, uh, that's what I want to do. And um, there's a lot of hard things I've had to go through and still go through today. And this road of being a business owner is, is not for everybody. It really is not. And, you know, there was points like, I mean, so I walked in the first, my first really school of hard knocks lesson in business was I got sued the first year I was in business. What? Yeah. And I, I, at the point like where, where I was getting like letters from lawyers and things like that. And all of a sudden I, and getting the letters and I didn't put two and two together that I was being sued. And this was about four or five months into it. And I was just like, I say, as the lawyer, I was like, am I being sued? Like, is this a lawsuit? Like, what is going on here? And the dude, the guy was just like, uh, yeah, buddy, you're being sued. I've been sending you letters for the last four months. You're being sued. They are coming mm-hmm. after you. And I just remember I was young. I was like my first year in business. And I was just like, what the fuck? Like, are you kidding me? Like, this doesn't happen. Like, this is like, I, I, I could like, and it was just very hard for me to get my head around that. And it was a really stressful time. And it was a certain person that was accusing me personally of hurting them and injuring them. It was just like a terrible thing. And I, and I had to go through it and it was like a two year stint. Right. Um, and that was the first thing that, I, and then all of a sudden, two years into it, we did well financially in the beginning. And then two years into it, things started to kind of slow down. And I was not good at understanding and managing money. And I had taken a lot of the cash I'd made and I had spent it because I had never seen the first couple of years in business. I was doing well. And I had never seen that much cash in my bank account. I was just like, oh my God, this is cool. Let me go buy this house. Let me go do this. <laughs> Look at that. And I didn't know. Like I was just a dumb trainer that just was like, oh, more money. Like, let's go. And I was stupid. And I remember getting to the point where I was um, standing in a parking lot in at nighttime once and talking to my best friend, Mike Waldron, who's now my CFO. And I had to like tell him, I was like, dude, we were doing well in the beginning, but I got no more money in that bank account. And I know we got a big tax bill coming up. It was always this weird thing because we would make a lot of money in the summertime because we trained athletes. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if you don't hold on to the money, you got to pay a big tax bill on that money that you made in October or October. I don't remember when it was in the fall. And uh, I didn't have enough money to pay the tax bill. And then I started putting stuff on credit cards and stuff like that. And I was just like, financially, I was like, holy cow. Like, I didn't realize like this is going to be like this. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's you build a team and there's people on your team that are now having children. And now you're like, holy shit. Like I'm responsible for that person's family. Like my business, the the actions I take and the things I do and the things that I say are now responsible for that person going home and putting food in their kid's mouth. I was like, that was like a crazy amount of, pressure and it like it, it just kind of all the, all this stuff just kind of like came up like it's just like lawsuit money problems huge weight on your shoulders for uh, for other people not to mention your own family that you're growing at the same time i was having kids and things like that and you're you're now all of a sudden go from having you know no nothing to pay for to having three kids to pay for which is like you know challenging and then all of a sudden there's 
the skills that you need to learn that you had no idea how to do. And you get to this point where you as your business grows, you get to this point where it's like, oh, I, I now have to lead, you know, at the time, I think we had 12 people on the staff. And I was just like, now I have to lead all these people. I don't know how to do this. I've never, never taught me how to lead and manage people. And then you get to a point where you need to grow the business and you need to learn marketing and sales. And it's just like, I was never taught. And, and it's just like, all of a sudden there's these, like this road you're on, you just like just get smashed and get smashed and get smashed with all these di different things. And, and here's the thing, this is how it was, you know, for me. And it, it's interesting, you know, we'll talk about some of the guys that are speaking in my event coming up and some of them have gotten to success way faster and way easier than I did. And I'm very grateful and happy for that. Um, but I look back on all these things and all these things I went through and all these things that I'm still going through because like, here's, I'll be honest in a situation, like I've never owned a marketing agency before. And now I own an agency that's scaling really fast, like really fast. And now I'm in a situation where like, okay, now I got to learn how to scale an agency. And I got to learn how to lead the people that are 2,000 miles away in San Antonio, Texas, and how to make sure that that thing stays going. Right. And so like as business grows, your personal skill sets need to grow. Um, your, um, your ability to uh, absorb challenges and problems is a skill that needs to be developed that you didn't think you would ever need to develop that. Um, and so growth is like this rocket ship of learning lessons. And what I love about it, what the, and that's the dark side, right? This is, I'm just saying the honest truth and that's my story. And I know some great entrepreneurs have had very similar stuff, right? But what I love about it, as hard as it is, um, what I love about it is that it's built in personal development and that I am a person today. I'm a 40, I'll be 45 next month. And I am a hundred times the person today than I was when I started. And I credit this experience, but I credit being a gym owner and I credit all the things that I've done and gone through to be able to make me who I am today. And that's again, and that's, and then at 45, I'll be saying the same thing about myself at 55 that I was at 45, right? It's just this never ending yeah. process. But what I love about owning a business, and this is, we're getting into the bright side of it. So I just kind of told the dark side, but the, the, the and there's more that's, I, I scraped <laughs> the surface with the amount of stories yeah. that I could, I, that I could tell you. Um, but the bright side is, is going through life with this constant um, um, aspiration to grow as a person. And it's like you, it's impossible not to. Like, even if you don't read a lot of books, even if you don't do a lot of personal design workshops, like it is impossible not to grow. You just grow through living and, and you go through living <laughs> the life and the experience, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the beauty of that and this is where I think that um, a lot of things start to happen that would have happened where there's this period of when you're going through the hard times and you're trying to figure out why you did what you did, that there's this period of self reflection. And one of my favorite quotes is like an unexamined life is not worth living. And through all these trials and tribulations and through all these struggles, I've had to look at myself and study who I am and the person that I am. Um, and it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And there's this period of self-acceptance that you have to go through. There's this period of self-development that you have to go through. There's this period of self-discipline that you create through all of it but none of it happens from just riding on the high of the good times yeah it is true you it's very humbling because like you just talked about one thing that i noticed that you said was like i you said it a couple times i wasn't good at i wasn't good i didn't know anything about or i was and that's okay 
sometimes people don't want to admit that all of us, I think at some point, maybe at the time you didn't want to admit it. Now it's like looking back at it, but I think what people forget, I always like, I think we talked about this before, but I always love that saying, just because you're a good cook doesn't mean you should open a restaurant. And I think that's the trainers look at one thing when they're like, for example, when they're in a big gym, they say, Oh, the split, I could be making a lot more money on my own. And they don't think about rent and getting new people and, you know, the sales and the marketing and the time and the bookkeeping and the accountants and the insurance and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think they don't look at any of that. And then, you know, throw in like what you talked about, the burnout and the possible lawsuits and the betrayals and the criticism and the money problems. And the and then when you're trying to learn something, I know you probably went through this over the years because you learn marketing. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I think I got a handle on it. And you're like, well, I got to learn sales. And then you learn sales and now you got to kind of go back to marketing. And then you got to like, what about my financial stuff? And I really have to sit down with Michael and, and learn some of the stuff that I could do on my own and at least understand it, blah, blah, blah. It's never ending battle. And I think uh, it's one thing that young trainers who just think they can open a gym, they don't realize, but at the same time, they don't realize that, that there is almost one shortcut and that is you talk about it a lot is kind of finding uh people who've done this yeah you know and it's not just because we're doing this and, and you know we're trying to sell something here you know you're a coach obviously you're a business coach but no matter what that the best people have found but coach boyle talks about sit next to you know I think schools get it all wrong. You should be sitting next to the smartest person and copying them, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's <laughs> the only possible shortcut, right? That uh, that that there is in this whole game. Yeah, I, I, and I want to go back to you know I didn't even mention COVID, you know, through all that, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 an interesting thing is like if you talk to the twenty three year old me, and you said. Hey, in at 27, you're gonna open a gym. And I just want to let you know ahead of time, here's what's going to happen. In your first year, you're gonna get sued. In your second year, you're gonna have money problems. In your third year, you're gonna like, right? And all of a sudden, in in 10 years, then you're gonna go through a pandemic. And you, you like it's just like if all of a sudden, like you told me all the stuff that was going to happen, like even COVID alone, like explain COVID to a gym or it's like, Hey, while you're owning a gym, this is going to happen. There's going to be this worldwide virus that comes in. It's going to shut your gym down for six months. And the government's going to like, not let you own your, it's just like, it's just like, no, thanks. <laughs> you're going to call your dad, right? right? You're going to turn right. around and call yeah. your dad at 23 right. back. <laughs> but again, going back to that, I, I don't know if, you become the person that you possibly can be without this experience and the fruit of all of it, the fruit of being a business owner is, is freedom is wealth. Um, and it's, it's the ability to transform others. And that's really the fruit of all of it. And I do believe the fruit is worth it. And it's interesting too. I think this transformation thing of having a career where you, wake up every day and your business does work that helps people change their life. I think we in the fitness industry take it for granted. And let me tell you the story to illustrate it. So one of my really good friends from Temple, I've been helping him lose weight. And we have a bet going on where actually he's he um I bet him that he couldn't lose 60 pounds by in six months. And um I had him write a check, a blank check for five grand. And I basically said, if you don't lose the weight, I'm taking this check and I'm donating it to a charity. And so now he's all on board, right? Um, and he actually lost, he just texted me yesterday. He's like 309, he's 301 now, started at 360. And he uh, is going to do it almost in three months instead of six. The entire wow. thing. But he said something very interesting. He said to me, he's like, you know, I'm out walking every day. And I see the people in my complex, he's a big dude, so they can tell he's lost weight. And yeah. the people in my complex are starting to say things like, oh, man, you're doing a good job. You're walking. I saw, I see you walking every day. 
I want to let you know that I started walking because you were walking. And then he went to the comic book store. And he goes, he's a comic book nerd. And he, he goes to the comic book store all the time. The guy at the comic book store has been seeing his progress. And the guy's like, I just want to tell you, I saw you like getting after it and working out and losing weight. And you inspired me. And I've lost eight pounds. And he's telling me these stories. Yeah. And he's like, man, he's like, this is the most rewarding thing in the world. Like, even <laughs> for me, it's just like, I thought it was going to be good for me. I didn't think I'd be inspiring other people. And he has this like whole new sense of, you know, um, satisfaction from the journey that he's on. And we get that every day. We take it for granted like, every day. Our whole lives are built around transforming, you know, other people. So that's the fruit of it, right? The fruit is freedom. The fruit is wealth if you do it right. And the fruit is, is transformation. But really what I want to share today is as you go through this journey, there's, there's, there's a poster I used to have in my room growing up called Footprints. And it's a picture of um, just like a a, 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 a single um, footprints in the sand, right? And it's like, dear God, it's talking to God. And basically it says, hey, God, you know, I was going through really hard times in my life. And the times that I saw that were the hardest, you weren't walking next to me. And then God says to that person, it's like, well it was through those times that I was carrying you. And that's why there was only one set of footprints. They were God's footprints, not hers. They were getting carried. And I look at that and I look at some of the people that have been in my life and the amount of gratitude I have for those people to be able to help me through all the challenging times that I've had. And so you know, this whole self-made thing, I am not even close to self-made. I'm made by all of the people that I've surrounded myself with that have helped me get to where we are today, right? And so that is really the big takeaway is who do you need? This journey is going to be challenging and hard, especially if you want to grow. If you want to grow, it's going to be harder. If you want to have a gym with 50 people and you want to run that gym for the next 20 years, it's probably not going to be that hard. And that's fine. But if you want to do something great and you want to make an impact in your community and an impact and, 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 and change the landscape of your life from a financial standpoint, um, you, you're going to go through some stuff and you're going to need people there. And I look back to the different types of people that I've had. I've had mentors, um, people that were just family members. I have a cousin. My cousin um, sold his company for $100 million five years ago. And he's been an advisor to me for a decade. It, no, more than that, more than that. He was actually my first uh, client. Actually, funny story. He, when I moved back to New Jersey, he was my first client. So I've been working with him since 2007. Wow. Um, Jeez. Yeah. He's a client. He's, he doesn't train with me anymore. He trains with one of the guys. But um, the first day I trained him, we were foam rolling in my mom's basement. And I don't know. He had some like equilibrium issue or something. But he got violently ill and went from foam rolling, we were doing T spine, and he was leaning back over the T spine oh foam roller, God. and he got violently sick and spent an hour puking in my mom's front yard. Oh my God! And I was this is my first session with him. I was like, "Oh, he ain't coming back." Is he I, the one who sued you? <laughs> no, <laughs> but but he's been like a guide of mine, you know. And, you know, I've never paid him for coach consulting. He's just does it because he's a family member and he helps me out. And it's like massive, right? But then there's like, there's other people, you know, that I've paid to coach me, right? That have hired business coaches along the way. I've hired advisors and mentors and things like that. And I think one of the smartest things in the world to do is when you're going to start a venture is to what, what, what do we try to do when we start a venture? We say, I got to figure this thing out. And I will never, ever do that again in my entire life. What I will do is, all right, I'm starting this venture. 
who has walked this path before? And how can I pay this person to tell me how to get the same success that they got, but a lot faster? And I think that that is like, if I ever give anyone advice on being a, being in business, it is that. It is just like, why, 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 why would you ever reinvent the wheel? Because usually in most cases, there's somebody that has done this that you can then very easily just say, teach me how to do this. I did this with my consulting business. As soon as I started a consulting business, I was just like, well, I don't know how to start a mastermind. I don't know how to write a long form sales letter. I don't know how to start a podcast. I don't know how to write a book. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. And so I found a guy and my coach is named Paul Gaw. And I found a guy that was doing it with physical therapists, similar business, but had a very successful business, was about five, six years ahead of me. And I was like, what do I need to do? <laughs> and he laid it all out for me. And I followed what he said. And it worked. And I think that a lot of times people are like, they try to figure it out all on their own. And I think that's that's a massive mistake. So the biggest piece of advice I have to business owners, whether they're starting out right away, or even if you're struggling, it's like, it's like, how do you, if you're struggling, you've hit a point where let's say you're like a stage three business owner, like I talk about, and you've got a point where you're like, you know, you're doing $500,000 in revenue and you, you cannot break through. You can't break it through a million. You're getting stuck at 500 and one year do you 550 and then you shrink down to 475, right? And you're just stuck. And what do they do? They're just trying to keep working. They work hard, they work hard, and they go do more, and they inject themselves back into the business, and profitability goes up a little bit because they were working. When there's someone that has done this already, there's someone that was stuck at 500000 that broke through and got to a million, and all you really need to do is ask them what they did. Let them tell you, and if you have to pay them, <laughs> great. But instead of like just trying to figure out on your own, and that's I've, I've created that process for every business I've been on. You know, when I was starting a license, I was calling people that ran licenses. What do I need to look out for? What do I need to do? So I I, I think that that's a, a really important piece of the equation, knowing that this journey that you walk as a business owner is riddled with challenges and problems and hard things and things you've got to go through. Um, and having those lifelines Right, it's almost like there's this um, this analogy of the lighthouse, right? And when you have this lighthouse, you you know, if you go out to the sea and the water's really rough, as long as you can see the lighthouse, like you're probably going to feel okay. But once that lighthouse is gone and you're in the middle of the ocean and it's yeah. dark and you can't see shit. Man, all you want is that lighthouse. All you want to do is you don't even need them to do anything. You just need to see that lighthouse and be like, okay, God, uh, that's where land is. I know as long as I have that lighthouse that yes. we're going to be okay. And that's that's what this these types of people have provided for me. The mentors, the and not even just the mentors, really. I'll, I will say that some of the biggest influences on me have been peers that I've met in other being part of – I've been a part of a mastermind since 2008. And some of my biggest my mo people I lean on most are people that I met in masterminds that are my now my peers. One of them speaking at um, our mastermind, Brent Gallagher. Guy runs a two point five million dollar gym. We lean on each other. You know, we lean on each other for for challenging times. We're both kind of you know walking the same path together, but that doesn't mean that you know I tell him stuff, he shares stuff with me. And it's, an, it's a beautiful relationship back and forth. And many of the guys in my mastermind have had that. I know, you know, you look at, I know your buddy, TJ Lopez, like he has that with Joe and Dan, you know, from Varsity House. Like it's yeah. like they, you meet and you meet these peers and there's, a, you need these levels of people in your life, right? There's a level of the mentor that you look up to that's, that's walked the path that you already have. And that's kind of the thing I provide for a lot of these people. Right. But then there's also those peers that are side, you're walking side by side that are like literally in the trenches right next to you. And you need to talk to those people too. Um, and so you get different things from different people. Vince, well, let me, let me ask you just a real quick question. How many, uh, one of the smartest things I think 
I've heard a co- only a couple of people ever do this, but they got coaching before they opened the gym. So they, they said, Hey Vince, you know, how many people have done that? What's well, like just a few, you have a few people that have, yeah, have, we have done a, that. We have a guy that just did it. Um, and he, he didn't have a gym. And I remember he, I forget which mastermind he came to, but he did not have a gym yet. And he joined the mastermind before you haven't had a gym. Nice. Nice. And he opened his first location with like 120 members. Nice. Yeah. Wow. He, That's yeah. awesome. And so he's like, he's like best decision ever made was hey. to hire Kiss Marketing to run the presale and basically have my consulting business guide him through the process. Yeah. It's awesome. What about one of the things a lot of times I know you have a what percentage of, of the group that comes in and, and then they end up probably leaving, but you go through all of this and they just won't listen. Like sometimes I remember saying with something, I forget what it was. This is a, a long time ago. I'm not going to, I'm going to stop listening to all other people. I'm just going to pick one. Like let's call him Bob Proctor. I think 15 years ago. And I'm, I'm just going to listen to Bob right now. I'm listening to too many people. Let me just listen to him and follow everything. He says, how many people do you want to just say, you're out. I can't take this anymore. We keep trying to help you. Uh, is there any percentage of people that you feel like just don't listen to what you say? I, I don't. Yes, there are. And actually I was getting on some people yesterday and I told them that like, I, this is what I told them. I was like, when I give you guys advice, I'm never, ever wrong. I just want to let you guys know that ever. I've never told you guys the wrong advice. And I'm kind of like bullshitting a little bit, right? Yeah, I'm like yeah. joking with them, right? Because yeah, I have been wrong on stuff for sure. Um, but one of the guys came on and he, he, I told him to fire someone 11 months ago. And I said, 11 months ago, you need to fire this person. You need to fire this person. And it took him 11 months to fire. Wow. And, and he got on the call and he was telling everyone, he was, just, he was like, listen to Vince. I don't listen to Vince. And like, and I, I didn't want to dig into what that cost him financially because we could reverse engineer that and it would not be pretty. Yeah. Right. Um, but here's the important thing to understand. There's a couple of things here. The first thing is to understand is that in your own business, you're very emotionally involved. And I just wrote, actually, I have my uh, latest. We are one of the few that still sends a print newsletter, but we send yeah. this newsletter every month. Yeah. Um, and the uh, title of my cover article is The Most Toxic Poison in Business. And the most toxic poison in business is emotion. And sometimes we get advice and we don't take the advice because we are emotionally involved at what will be. And sometimes the advice you get is hard to implement. It's not easy advice for someone to, it's very easy for me to say, raise your prices. It's not easy for that person to overcome all of the challenges that come with raising your prices. And that is because they're getting emotionally involved. And now it's not that you are emotionally involved. It's not like, oh, you got to remove your emotions. But what you do need to do is understand that the people that you're you're paying to help or the people that you've trusted to help, they are not. And they have what, what I like to call clear eyes. And a lot of people don't have clear eyes about their own business. And that's why you get help. You get help and you get people that have clear eyes on your business and they're not tainted by all the other things that have happened in all the previous years that are tainting you to on the business. The second thing I'll say to that is trust yourself. Whether you get advice from one person or others, you, you have to, at the end of the day, trust yourself and you have to make decisions based on that. So your, your question about multiple people, that's fine. I think you should have multiple voices and things it does get confusing when there's too many, right? So you don't want too yeah. many, but I have several different coaches I work with on a regular basis right now. Some for different things and, yeah. and things like that. But at the end of the day, you have to get the advice and then you have to trust yourself to move forward. But understand that the advice you did get was coming from a place of clarity because they weren't emotionally involved in the business. Yeah. If you're ever selling your house, it's very similar. You get so emotional with if somebody doesn't like, like, oh, I don't like the way mm-hmm. this is that, right? And I sold my parents' house for them. 
no realtor because it was an as is situation. It was so easy. Like I had no, I didn't care. You know, I just wanted to get rid of it. So I was like, and somebody said this to me one time, look, you either want to make money or you want to sell your house, like pick one and go from there. But it's so good to like, you know, you get a realtor. That's why you get a realtor. Let them deal with all that crap. Stay away from the noise. Stay away from the personal stuff. But emotion, you're so right, man. It's very similar. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so now you, when you talk about your masterminds, I mean, you're talking about the what you you have one coming up. So, but that's yeah, not. You, what and you're, you're coming, right? I'm hoping to come. But here's the thing: whoa, Vince, I, I'm going to Denmark on July July fifth. I get back to 15th. It might be tough for me to, I forgot, I forgot that I was going to Denmark, but um, so it might be hard for me to turn around and come back, come over to Jersey um, on the 19th and 20th. We That's all a have, Friday. Sometimes we have to do hard things. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, Vince, what exactly, I just want to go over this because there, you have a lot of levels. Like there's the inner circle, there's masterminds, there's group, the, the, the coaching group. Can you just go over like what, What's that first step in terms of, hey, I don't know if I want to make this commitment. Is that what the mastermind, this, what you call the mastermind really is? Yeah. Um, so we meet in person and I think in person stuff is so important. I don't think a lot of people do yeah. it. I think that getting yes. in the room physically with people has been, it's, it's a godsend. You know, I really do think that the energy that people get uh, from those events are, are, are super important to do. Um, but yeah, we meet three times a year as, as a crew and yeah, there's, there's varying levels, but the majority of people, they start, um, you know, in the SPF mastermind and then eventually move up to CEO or private coaching or something like that. But, um, I think that the, um, the meetings are kind of like the cornerstones and then, in between the meetings, there's a, the gaps are bridged through, uh, we meet weekly as a group on Wednesdays. And so every week we're meeting. And so now there's like this kind of, there's the meeting, the big immersion, you know, getting clarity again, a lot of times too, like, it's like, you know, between around every four months, we start to lose steam. You start to lose focus. It's kind of just natural. And so I think what the meet, the regular meetings do is they kind of, kind of pipe you back up. And they get you rethinking, um, you know, what do you, and refocusing on the goals and the things that you need to you get excited up. after those. Yeah. I know with, with yeah. my, when I was working with Michael Hyatt, every three months we went, it was all like, you got so re-energized, you got yeah. charged up and uh, you refocused. You need that. Like every business owner needs that. They need to be able to get a, whether that's a mastermind or whether that's a coaching group, or whether it's just a vacation or whatever, but you need to recharge and reset. And what I think that, the the meetings do is that you recharge and reset not just for your own business but you get the energy from being around the other people right you're being a you're a part of a group where people are having success and they're excited about owning a gym and they're excited about getting results and they're excited about expanding and growing and that is like kind of contagious there's like this vibration that they all give off vince one thing i wanted to talk about and i know you mentioned this earlier at some point um one underrated piece of the mastermind is owning a business can be super lonely um, because a lot, if, if you do it the wrong way for a lot of entrepreneurs, yeah. it, it could be lonely and it could be, you know, you spend a lot of time doing stuff you really don't want to do if you're not doing right. Like, like I said, like bookkeeping and all these other things that you need to make sure these housekeeping details and you're trying to juggle a bunch of things. And, um, and especially nowadays where we've kind of, decrease that human contact for on a lot of levels i think these these type of things part of me i know for me my personality when i get around that many people my energy you know i do get recharged and i think that's the one thing with this is that like it's not just um uh you know being around people it's also being around like-minded people and people that you know the, we always love the the saying you're the you're the product of the gym Rohn, you're the product of the five people you hang around with uh you know when you go to these kind of masks you know you're the product of the 75 you know it's people. you know it's funny uh i saw a, a tim ferris post um and 
that Tim Ferriss posted is like, if I had one piece of advice to give any business owner and I could put it on a billboard and I only had one shot, it would be that quote. Yeah. That's pretty, that's saying a lot. Like Tim yeah. Ferriss, pretty smart dude. Um, and that's, that's saying a lot, but going back to uh, your point of being alone, uh, are you aware of the most uh, violent form of punishment in prison? Solitary confinement? Yes, correct. That is the most violent type of punishment at, in prison. It's not beating you up or anything like that. It's solid. It's putting you in a box Crazy. and sitting there with your own thoughts for you know yes. however long. Oh. And that's what a lot of people are doing. They're sentencing themselves to solitary confinement by not having any second voices in their conversation. So the only conversations that they're having is with their own minds. Yeah, that's, that's and, an and, interesting. And talk, talk about confirmation bias, right? Right. Like talk about like, oh my God, like reinforcing your own beliefs and reinforcing your own thoughts. Like when you have no one else to talk to, you're just reinforcing everything you believe in. Your stories are sounding really, really good, you know? And uh, it's, it's, man, I, and I'll tell you this, it's like, I, I started doing um, this thing called business Hills with my friend, Dr. Justin Rabinowitz. And every Wednesday we meet and we, we run Hills and we run up the hill and then we walk and we, and we, then we walk we walk down the hill and we walk down the hill. We talk business. We don't talk much going up the hill. So we try after the first couple, like there's no words being said up the hill. Because right? yeah. we're, bre we're breathing heavy, but it's like a great thing. We walk to the hill, we talk business, talk life and stuff. And he he does the same thing. So he has a, a business a mastermind for chiropractors. So if there's any chiropractors listening to this, they should definitely look up Dr. Justin Rabinowitz. Um, but just that, just in the few weeks that we've been doing that, I look forward to that, man. I look forward to that Wednesday, eight o'clock, hit the hill talking business, seeing what he's got cooking. He's learning what I've got cooking. We're talking about ideas. We're challenging problems. Um, and it's, it's an amazing outlet and it's such a great conversation, you know, for, for me to have. And a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that, you know, in their life because they don't really talk to their spouse about business. They don't talk about their employees about business. Um, and they don't have the the people that I like that I had that my cousin, my, my cousin, Jim, like I, a lot of people don't have those people in their lives. Um, and, and what you need to do is you need to find them because, because I will say this one, those people will get you where you want to go a lot faster. Um, but two, they will help keep you in the game a lot longer. Love it. Well, you got a mastermind coming up. So let's talk about it. Yes. So I kind of look at, there's two growth paths, right? If you, and I say growth path, there is the path of starting a gym and, you know, getting 25 clients and sticking, holding, hunkered down and being good. But most of the people in my group, they want to grow, but they want to grow in different ways. And we have two paths that most people are on in my group. And the first path is they want to grow one gym and make as much money and profit as possible in that gym and then take the money that they make and invest in real estate and invest in the market and you know have other but they want that one thing that linchpin that's giving them the cash to be able to grow their wealth the second path is the scale path and a lot more are doing this now a lot more because people are seeing this and this is definitely the most financially lucrative way to do it. And they're opening up multiple locations. They're opening up, uh, not all of them are doing it exactly like this, but the most common is to open a 2000 square foot, small group, personal training business, four to six people. Um, and they're making them simple and easy and they're doing a lot of them. And they're committing to doing a lot of them. It's the, the path that's kind of like this unbeaten path is like this. It's like I'm going to open a second gym with no no aspiration to open a third. I'm just I'm going to open a second gym because I want two gyms. And I always go back to the Seth Godin line. You know, I asked Seth Godin ten years ago, like, should I open a second gym? And he's like, I think you should think long and hard about opening a second gym. Running a gym means you run a gym. 
running five gyms and means you're in the business of running gyms, but running two gyms, it kind of just means you're all over the place. And yeah. all, not everyone, but almost everyone that I know that's opened up two gyms, they're kind of like all over the place. And the people that I've known that have opened multiple gyms with the plan of opening a lot of them, they do them right because you have to do them right. Right. There's a book, uh, solid dance, solving uh, 10 X is easier than two X. Right. So once you start and you get 10 gyms is easier than two gyms, because when you, when you open 10 gyms, it's because you have to, you can't open up 10 gyms and have random 10 gyms do all over the place, doing different things. You'll just, you, it, it'll end you. But if you open up 10 gyms, you're like, all right, I have to do this in a way that's simple, that's repeatable, that's reliable. Um, and I have to build systems around this and I need a good hiring and recruitment plan and all of that goes into it. And so I look at these two paths that people are on and this is the growth path, right? And so it's not saying that the only way to grow is to open up multiple locations. You can grow your wealth with one gym. I'm living proof of it, right? I'm doing it, right? I have one gym and I have now taken the profits that I made at my gym and invested and launched other companies and other businesses and invested in marketing, invested in real estate, right? So I've, 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 that's my path, right? But then you have someone like Devin Gage, right? That's opening up multiple gyms and that's his path. Either path is fine. But the reality is you need business skill sets for each path, right? And that's really what we're going to be unpacking is what are the skill sets to grow? Some of them will be different, but a lot of them will be the same. And we're going to be talking about the business skills that a gym owner needs to be able to scale or maximize the current business that they have. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Very cool. And I see that you have, you mentioned Brent Gallagher and he has one gym, but it's $2.5 million. So you have that piece of it. And then, like you said, you're, you've done that. And then uh, who else? Uh, John Carlo. Yeah, John Carlo, who's one of our superstar success stories. He great, great story. He started in the mastermind at 23 years old. He had one location and he was doing seven thousand dollars a month. And he was just like, I don't know if I can know. He was gonna take my surge course. And it was like five my surge course was like five hundred bucks at the time. It's a lot more now. Um, and he's like, I don't know if I can afford this. I don't know if I can do this. And he and he finally did it. And he ended up making he ended up adding 25 clients in the first three weeks of the, in the surge. And so he's been in the group ever since. Yeah. But now yeah. he has, four, he's scaling, he's scaling fast. He has four gyms. He's doing a, over a hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue. He's got gyms all over Philadelphia. Um, and he's got to do a talk on like what he's doing to grow and scale and how he's doing it so quickly. And um, so he's going to share that story. So you have Brent who's kind of sharing from the one gym side of one massive monster Right. And then you have the scaling side. And then the cool thing is there's tons of people in the group that are doing both paths. Yeah. Right. There you have the Devin Gage, as I mentioned before, that's doing multiple. You have Joe and Dan doing multiple. Um, but then you have Brent Gallagher that's got one. You have me that has one. You have um who else has one? Um I want to say a lot of them are scaling now, but you have Eric Driver that has one. Like there's there's a lot of um there's both, right? Um, but what we're going to do is share the skill sets needed to grow. And because either way is a growth path. There's definitely there's some different things you'll need to learn for each path, but there are a lot of them are the same. And we're going to kind of unpack the, the skill sets that they need to be able to do that. Very cool. Will you, when they come in, will you say, okay, you're with nah. the groom or the bride, nah. you have to go to the right? <laughs> nah. No, nah. because okay. there's not there's not a right yeah. or wrong way to do it. And you could learn right? from those other people. You might but, change. But, your but mind. think of it like this: either way, you're going to need to learn. Here, here's the thing: either way, either path, you're going to learn. Need to know how to lead and manage people. Either way, you're going to need to know how to market and sell really well, and how to train people to market and sell. Either way, you're going to need to know how to understand and read financial statements, and understand and run your business from the data standpoint. Either way, you're going to need to know how to create uh, a leadership team where you have people under you that are leading other people. Um, so either path, you need business skill sets to grow. 
maybe if you're going to be, it's going to be you and one trainer and that's what all you want, you may not need all these skill sets. You probably can make it work with just you being a good coach and a good trainer and a good relationship person and a good reputation in the community. You probably would be okay. But when you start getting to the point where you get into that million dollar level, right? There's going to be things that you're going to need to know and learn to be able to succeed at that level. Um, and some of them is mindset. A lot of them is mindset. And I don't talk a lot about mindset outside the lines, right? But I talk a ton about mindset inside the groups. And every um, every meeting, I start the meeting with um, some type of memorable mindset lesson. And one of the ones, and, and it's funny because I, I'm actually – contemplating doing a greatest hits of all the mindset lessons that I've done. Um, but one of the mindset lessons that I taught, I think it was three or four meetings ago, and it's been like a new mantra for me. Um, and it's the word, so what? And if you could put so what after most things that happen to you and be and probably be in a better position than freaking out about it. There's very few things that deserve like a really big reaction to it. Like all yeah. of a sudden, if like there's a huge problem and like your wife says, I'm leaving you, like you're not gonna be like, so what? Like, <laughs> like you know, you know what I'm saying? Like it's like, so there's things like, but for most things, it's like, oh, this client quit. Oh my God, but everyone else is gonna quit down no, there. No, client quit. So what? We'll get another one. All right. Or oh, this this like so what it's like putting so what after everything and it just enables you to not it, it, what it does is it helps you put things in perspective and i think the perspective habit is one of the most important habits to have as an entrepreneur how yeah. important is this really and am i because if you take this it's almost like revving your engine it's like you're in the parking lot and to get out of the parking lot you floor it at 60 and all you end up doing is burning a bunch of gas and like, like there's no reason to go that fast in the parking lot, right? And that's what you do when you bring these big reactions to every problem that you have across your day, whether it's your business life or personal life. If you just throw a so what after it, it's just like, it just makes your life so much better. It's just almost like Jocko's so good. Yeah, similar, right? similar Very to similar. it. Yeah. But yeah, so just like, so what? So that's one of the mindset lessons I taught. So what? Very cool. It's like, so what? Yeah, love it. Um, cool. So that's July 19th and 20th at Gabriel Fitness and Performance. Yeah, I'm um, doing it cool. at, at um, uh, that's what I, cool. I am um, doing it at my gym. And and the reason I'm doing that is I like to people to see not just they're learning stuff, you know, about business, but to actually be in the right environment. Now, most of the time we can't do it yeah, because the group's getting so big, we're going to need to be at a hotel. So this is probably the last time I can do it in my gym anyway. Yeah. Um, but I like people to be in the environment where they're going to go home and do it themselves. Um, but also how I know, I mean, you know this better than anybody because you did all the gym tours, right? Yeah. You learn so much just from walking through a gym and seeing the master, seeing the bathrooms and yeah. looking at all the different things on the walls and, and, and seeing like they can look at our programming sheets and you know, or my trainers are going to be there. And so there's going to be a lot. So it's always a lot to learn um, from, from being inside the walls of, of a business. So. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, Vince, thanks for doing this. Again, we'll have all the links. A reminder at shrinkwitchpodcast.com. But um, July 19th to 20th in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. Mastermind with, guys, don't forget, I don't have, Vince is obviously speaking. Coach Boyle is speaking. Joe Hashi, Giancarlo Regni, and Brent Gallagher. So uh, all good. Vince, thanks for doing this, bud. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, brother. Peace.